Good afternoon, and welcome to this World Affairs Council of Orange County session uh, with Admiral James DeBritis and Elliot Ackerman, where we're going to be discussing their new book, 2034, a novel of the next world war. And uh, welcome to all of you who are joining us uh, for this, this session. You know, in recent uh, events, we've had members of the audience who were, who were as far as Dubai and the London and Canada and throughout the United States. So wherever you are, uh, we're happy to have you with us and we look forward to you being involved in this, uh, in this event. I'm uh, Richard Downey, I'm the chair of our programs committee from the World Affairs Council of Orange County. And uh, we, we really want you to be involved in this event. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Admiral Stavridis and Elias, Elias Ackerman with us. And uh, what you can do by, uh, you can ask a question at any time, simply by going down to the bottom of your screen and clicking your Q&A button down there. And you can ask a question. Uh, we'll, uh, we will get to those questions during the question and answer period when our vice chair, Rick Putnam, will be uh, fielding questions. But uh, anytime throughout the event that you have a question, feel free to go ahead and, and post that. Um, what we'll do now is move. We're very fortunate to have our moderator, Kyle Longley. Dr. Longley is the director of the War and Society program at Chat Chapman University, where he's also a professor of history. And he's a distinguished author in his own right. He's published nine books and many scholarly articles. And we are very proud to have him as a member of our programs committee. So without anything further, let me pass it to Kyle, if you would please introduce our guests and, and begin the session. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Richard. Uh, we are uh, especially blessed today to have two wonderful people uh, to speak about this uh, new novel that they've created called 2034. Uh, let me just do a quick interview. I mean, I could spend uh, 25 minutes just doing their biographies, but I'll try to condense it a little bit. But Elliot Ackerman is the author of several novels, most recently Red Dress uh, in Black and White, and uh, an incredible memoir, uh, Places and Names on War, revolu uh, Revolution, and Returning, uh, which I was just telling Colonel Downey, I put up there with Philip Caputo's Rumor of War and Sledge's uh, With the Old Breed as far as uh, wonderful memoirs that I would recommend. Uh, his books have been nominated for a number of awards, including the National Book Award and the Andrew Carnegie Medal in both fiction and nonfiction. His writing often appears in Esquire, The New Yorker, and The New York Times, where he is a contributing opinion writer. He is also both a former White House fellow and a Marine who served five tours of duty in Iraq, Afghanistan, where he received commendations, including a Silver Star and a Bronze Star. Admiral Jim Stavridis is my good friend that I've known for, uh, gosh, uh, we're probably going on 15, 20 years. Uh, I'm so happy to welcome him here. He spent more than 30 years in the US Navy, largely as a destroyer commander, but also an aircraft uh, carrier uh, battle group uh, commander, rose to the uh, rank of four-star admiral. Uh, he was also Supreme Allied Commander of Europe as well as Southcom. He spent, uh, he has a PhD from Fletcher uh, School for International uh, Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, where he also served as the Dean for six years. Uh, you can see him every time you turn on the television uh, as a commentator for a group's MSNBC across the board, uh, as well as a person who writes uh, opinion pieces, including a monthly one for Time Magazine. He's the author of a slew of books, all of which I recommend and all of which I've read. Uh, I've been very blessed to, like I say, get a copy, usually a very good signed copy. So he is now the chairman of the board of the counselors of the McClarty Group Global Associates, an international consulting firm, and an operating executive of the Carlisle Group, uh, International Private Equity. So we're so happy to have you guys here today. And uh, I did look this morning. I think you guys have risen to number six on the New York Times hardcover uh, bestseller list. So congratulations on that. And I'm just going to open with just a simple question. I know you've got uh, some ideas on which to bounce, but I found it very interesting that you chose to do a novel rather than like a traditional public affairs uh, or history book. And so I think by choosing that format, I'd like to know one, why you chose the format, two, then how you chose to create the plot as well as the characters. So I will turn this over. I think Admiral Stevaritis wanted to start. And again, welcome. 
Thanks, Kyle. Uh, great to be with you. Indeed, a friend of uh, pushing 20 years. And uh, Colonel Rich Downey, a colleague from my days at U.S. Southern Command, someone who knows Latin America and the Caribbean better than almost anybody I know. Um, I've spoken before to the World Affairs Council out there and always enjoy my visit. So thanks for having me and for having Elliot, who I'm sure has appeared before you uh, previously as well. I thought I'd start by answering Kyle's excellent question, why a novel? How did this come about? And the answer is sometimes to look into the future, you have to look into the past, right? And so as I look back on the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union, it struck me that as we look at the growing tension with the US and China, we may very well be in a new Cold War with China. So what can we learn by looking to the past? One thing I know about the Cold War, and I'm old enough to remember it and will always be a, a naval officer of the Cold War, uh, dancing around on destroyers around the Soviet Navy all over the world. Uh, one thing I know is that there was a rich literature of the Cold War. So it was books like The Bedford Incident, Fail Safe, uh, Red Storm Rising, The Third World War by Sir John Hackett and many, many others. I think that rich literature, and by the way, it was not just uh, books, it's films like Dr. Strangelove, On the Beach, um, that rich body of art, I think, helped prevent the Cold War from becoming a hot war. How? Because it showed us, it allowed us to imagine how terrible such a war would be, and in very graphic terms often. And it also helped us imagine what are the events that could lead us from this Cold War into something inexorably worse, a hot war. That's the story, of course, of the Bedford incident, set in a very small frame on a destroyer in the North Atlantic pursuing a Soviet submarine. So I thought a lot about that Cold War uh, literature and art, and I decided for my 10th book, I've written nine previous books, all nonfiction. For my 10th book, I wanted to write a novel because you can insert characters into it because it allows you to kind of throw off the straitjacket of fact. You don't have to footnote things. You don't have to prove that things are right. You can really splash some paint around on the canvas. And thirdly, because let's face it, a lot more people are gonna end up reading it than yet another uh, serious, earnest, important nonfiction book about the dangers of war with China. So, I took that idea to my uh, wonderful agent at uh, Penguin Press, a guy named Scott Moyers. And in a nutshell, this was a longer conversation, but in a nutshell, he said, Admiral, you're a great guy. We really like your writing, but you're not a novelist. And I said, yes, I am. I can write a novel. And he said, Admiral, I know a novelist who might want to work with you. And he said, uh, his name is Elliot Ackerman. And of course, he didn't know that I knew Elliot well, and perhaps I'll let Elliot pick up the story from there. Elliot. Thanks, Jim. Um, sure, so as Jim mentioned, you know, we have a uh, shared editor at Penguin Press, um, but we'd known each other for the better part of a decade before, both being graduates of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where the Admiral served uh, as the Dean. And while he was Dean, he had um, invited me to be writer in residence for a semester. And one of the bullet points in my responsibilities was talk with the dean about books when he feels like it. So, you know, we'd spend like many an afternoon sitting in his office, just sort of, you know, talking about things we were reading, what we were thinking about. So I, you know, so we both knew one another's sensibility. And um, when our shared editor kind of mentioned this prospect to me, uh, you know, just immediately, it made a lot of sense. Um, you know, we talked about the book, you know, and it turned out, you know, we had a very much a shared vision of what we thought this book could be, which was something that was, as Jim mentioned, you know, character driven, focused on world affairs, but really with, um, with almost an intimate feeling about it. Uh, and something that was lean, you know, you were going to turn the pages, this wasn't going to be a, a tome that sits unused on your bookshelf at 900 pages telling you every detail, this was going to be a book that, uh, 
that tried to grab you by your little pals and wake you up and leave you sitting with characters you remember. So we were very much aligned on that point. Um, we had a bit of an outline and we said, hey, let's, let's see if we can write the first chapter. So we sat down and we batted around ideas, figured out what we thought the first chapter would be. Um, but we managed to write the first chapter and the first one led to a second and uh, the rest is history. And that's how the book was written. So let me pick up from there by telling you how the book opens, because I, I doubt many of you have had a chance yet to read the book. I sincerely hope you do. Again, it's a cautionary tale. It's not good guys and bad guys. The villain of the piece is war. And the book opens with a naval incident in the South China Sea with a group of Navy destroyers commanded by Commodore Sarah Hunt, uh, who investigate a Chinese merchant ship that appears to be in distress, as they're required to do under international rules of the road. The investigation leads to a surprise, to an incident. By the end of the day, Commodore Hunt's destroyers are at the bottom of the ocean, and she survives barely with a handful of her sailors. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, almost simultaneously, a Marine Corps pilot, a fighter pilot, is flying his brand new, beautiful fifth generation, sixth generation joint strike fighter close to the Iranian airspace border. Suddenly he loses control of the aircraft and it starts flying itself. It flies itself to a perfect landing in Iran. Um, those two events precede an encounter in the White House between a deputy national security advisor and a senior Chinese naval officer who comes from the embassy of China to deliver a very interesting message. Along the way, there's a blink of a cyber attack and everything I've described is in the first 20 pages. So the book unspools from there uh, all around the world. Uh, it's a story of the US and China who managed to stumble into a serious conflict. It's character driven. So right. to close this introductory piece, let me ask Elliot to just describe five of the central characters in 2034. Yeah, sure, thanks Jim. So um, yeah, as the Admiral mentioned, the, when the book opens, we meet uh, Commodore Sarah Hunt on the bridge of her flagship on a freedom of navigation patrol in the South China Sea. And Sarah Hunt is a second generation sailor she, her father worked in Naval Special Warfare, where in the year 2034, she is also a veteran of Naval Special Warfare as a female, um, but due to a parachute injury, had to be retired out of those ranks and is finishing her career in the surface Navy. When we meet her, she's sort of mulling over the long arc of her career, wondering what it's all meant, um, because this is probably gonna be her last patrol on the high seas. We also mentioned that brand new F-35 strike fighter. Um, well, it's being piloted by a Marine major whose pedigree is anything but new. He is a fourth generation Marine fighter pilot. His great grandfather flew with Pappy Boynton in the South Pacific. His grandfather flew in Vietnam dropping Snape and Nape at tree level. And his father flew sorties, probably for me and my buddies in Iraq and Afghanistan. But Wedge at the end of this tale of you know, aerial martial glory is sort of lamenting the fact that he feels as though he's become nothing more than a technocrat. And as he's thinking those thoughts, that's when he loses control of his plane and is forced down into Iran. And when the phone rings in the Situation Room in the White House, uh, with, with word of those two instances, the person placing the call is the Chinese military attache to the United States, Admiral Lin Bao, a senior naval officer, frustrated that he's not at sea, also towards the end of his career. A career has been very interesting because one of the things that has defined it is his dual identity. Uh, he is the son of an American mother, but raised abroad in China, something that is, has very much made his career within the Chinese military because he's someone who possesses unique insight into the American mind, but it's also been a challenge for him throughout his career because he feels as though he's never truly been accepted and been above suspicion inside of China. The person he's calling at the White House is Sandy Chowdhury, a mid-level functionary on the national security staff. 
Indian American, second generation. Um, and he's someone who will play a key role because he also has ties to his country of origin, India, which is a significant player in the book. And the last character I'd mentioned to you uh, is one that is near and dear to my heart. And he is our uh, consummate veteran of the forever wars. So he's not an American, he is Iranian brigadier Qasim Farshad of the Iranian Quds Force. Qasim, because he's the namesake of Qasim Soleimani, his godfather. Uh, Qasim Farshad's father was killed subverting an assassination attempt many decades before against Soleimani, before his, as we know, untimely death. And when our pilot, Chris Wedge Mitchell, is taken down inside Iran, the person he meets on the airstrip is Qasim Farshad. And with those five characters, those are the characters who take you into the world of 2034 and the story spans continents as this crisis uh, continues to escalate and uh, unfold. So, Kyle. Yeah, read. that's a wonderful overview. And as you know, I, I really hope people will pick this book up and read it. But let me take you into the, one of the major points that stood out to me. And I know this is something dear uh, to the Admiral, and that is the whole centrality of cybersecurity and cyber war uh, that is built strongly throughout the whole novel. And I'd just like to ask you guys to sort of, you know, flesh this out, how you see this within the novel, but also where you see it today and what's going to happen into the future. Um, I'll start, and certainly by 2034, um, what we think we understand today about cyber, cyberspace, um, will all have changed significantly because toward the end of this decade will come something called quantum computing. I'm not going to drag you back into high school physics to explain what that means. Just bear with me. Suffice to say, it means everything can change and become harder, more complex, but also more useful. Uh, we don't know how it will play across the world of combat, but I think it will have a significant impact. Um, that's why in the novel 2034, 10 to 15 years from now, one of the first big events is a massive cyber attack. Um, you see threads throughout the novel of the use of cyber. You also see very conventional warfare alongside it. But uh, in, in my mind, uh, as we go forward into this 21st century, the coin of the realm in defense in military activity is gonna be cybersecurity, unmanned vehicles from the outer reaches of space to the bottom of the ocean, unmanned and special forces, small numbers of truly elite troops, kind of starship troopers. This of course was Elliot's background, uh, Marine Raider, the equivalent of a Navy SEAL. Although he'll tell you the Raiders are a lot better than Navy SEALs. Um, Kyle, that's the frame of the novel, but a lot of people will wonder, well, why is it getting so challenging in the world of cyber? And there's actually a pretty simple answer to that that may or may not surprise people. Today, there are 7 billion people on the planet Earth. Um, today, there are about 40 billion devices connected to the internet. This is the internet of things. And that's great. I can pick up my iPhone and turn on my coffee pot. Uh, terrific. But it is an enormous threat surface. It means there's 40 billion ways to come in and get to another place and find another server. It makes attribution unbelievably difficult, figuring out who's even coming and attacking you. And don't take my word for it. Go read the newspapers of the last 30 days in which we've seen a massive Russian cyber hack took down 400 of the Fortune 500 companies, sometimes called the Solar Winds hack. More significantly, they took down FireEye. That's one of the absolute best cyber security companies in the world who discovered the Russians maneuvering through their circuits after about six months. Think about that for a minute. And even more recently, three days ago, we see attacks on the Microsoft exchanges probably coming from China. So this is very real. 
uh, it's part of the novel and it'll increasingly be part of our world. Elliot, would you like to follow up? I would only add, you know, one of the things that's challenging about cyber is how do you, how do you show it to people? Um, because it's not an attack on Pearl Harbor. It's not uh, kinetic per se. And that was one of the challenges we had in the novel. And I think early on, I remember us discussing, you know, how are we going to show this attack to readers? And the image we settled on was we're basically going to blink the entire East Coast. Um, and that's, without giving too much weight, that's what you see almost akin to, if you remember several years ago, that night during the Super Bowl where all the lights went out and then they all came right back on. Uh, and that was sort of a powerful visual testament to the, to, to the threat that cyber represents. Yeah, so like I say, the centrality I think is very important in the story uh, for setting it in the future. So I thought you guys did an extremely uh, good job there. Admiral? One last point is simply who's winning? you know, between the U.S. and China. At this minute, as we sit here tonight, the U.S. is still ahead, but the margin, and let's put it in chronological terms, I would say five years ago, we were three or even four years ahead of China in cyber, in offensive and defensive mechanisms, in the, the pathway to quantum computing. I'd say now we're maybe a year ahead. They are accelerating rapidly in this regard. And uh, we need to invest more in science, technology, mathematics. Uh, we need to uh, provide government research and development funds. The private sector isn't gonna do this just out of the goodness of its heart or because the free markets demand it because they don't, Elliot's point, until the world sees an example of something dramatic. So this is one where there's a real role for government. We're losing our edge. We need to be mindful. That is one of the lessons of 2034. Thank you for that. Well, let me follow up because the centrality of China, and I think this is something that especially interests us. I mean, I'm not saying this for, uh, but on the West Coast, I think it is especially uh, interesting topic. But there have been a number of articles written in the past few years highlighting that we may be exaggerating China's uh, capabilities. There was a great article, Michael Schumann's Don't Believe the China Hype in the Atlantic in June of 2020. Where do you see China as a threat as well as a potential collaborative um, partner? Uh, China is not 10 feet tall. And I'll give you four or five things that I wouldn't want to see here in the United States. Their demographics are bad. They're aging rapidly. Their gender misbalance is dramatic. They have many more men than they do women, which is newsflash, perhaps not the best way to structure your society. Creates all kinds of internal pressures and dynamics. They have an environmental catastrophe that is gonna to need to be remediated in their own country. Uh, they are not a democracy. Sooner or later, that pot on the stove of governance because there is no way for that lid to have a safety valve. That safety valve is called democracy. Sooner or later, that pot starts to get truly stressed. Um, and finally, China has very few to no real allies in the world or friends. Um, and they're at odds with virtually all of their neighbors. Think about that. Compare that to the United States. Our demographics are strong. We're still a young nation. People want to come here. Uh, everywhere I went as Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, I went to every embassy, went to over 100 embassies over those four years. Everywhere I went, there were lines of people outside the U.S. Embassy. Why? Because they want visas. They want to move here. Our southern border, which we need to control, it's a serious challenge, but uh, people want to come here. Uh, we have vast arable land, fresh water, timber. Uh, we are without question a dynamic society. Look at Silicon Valley, look at innovation, look at the 128 tech belt around Boston, biotech, look at our university system, still the envy of the world. We've got lots of challenges and problems, but I would not trade places with China. So they're not 10 feet tall. On the other hand, 
They are rising rapidly in capability. And, and Kyle, you're the historian. You're well familiar with Graham Allison's, uh, I think, seminal work on the idea of the Thucydides trap, that um, any time in the international system, an established power is challenged by a rising power, the odds are uh, two in three that it'll lead to a global war. It goes all the way back to the Peloponnesian Wars, Athens challenged by Sparta. 100 years ago, Great Britain challenged by the Kaiser's Germany. Today, the United States established power, China rising power. Therefore, when I put all that together, um, I'm concerned. And I think 10 to 15 years from now when the book is set is a period in which China may have surpassed us in some areas of technology. Nationalism, I believe, will be a prominent feature of their internal psychology in the nation. They won't have resolved many of the challenges I just mentioned. And therefore, there'll be friction at many, many push points between the United States and China, roughly in the year 2034. Elliot, how would you like to follow up on that? I would just follow up with uh, you know, the, the idea that that's what we are trying to capture in the book is sort of how do you take all of those macro ideas and craft a story around it that seems relatable to people. You know, oftentimes we, you know, we look at all the interconnectivity that exists between the United States and China, particularly economically, and we believe that a war couldn't happen because war wouldn't be in everybody's best interest. But if you look back historically, you can point to dozens and dozens of wars that were fought that were in no one's best interests. And I think it's important to understand that you know, war is its sort of own breed of distinctly human insanity. And so you cannot wholly rationalize why wars are fought. So you have to get into the individuals who are the participants of war. That's why when we look at the great histories, you know, they're always honing in on the, the quirks of the people who are the key participants. You know, the First World War obviously being an iconic example of that in which it wasn't in anyone's interest to go to war and yet we went to war anyways. So I think you know, specific to the book, we wanted to, because we couldn't do that obviously historically, so we needed to project forward and say, all right, who are these people and how are they going to lead us into a war in 2034? Not saying that this is going to happen, but saying were this to happen, this is what it might look like. And so let's all guard against it ever happening. I like the point that you guys have raised time and time again. This is a cautionary tale, not a predictive uh, story. And I think that was a very appropriate uh, description. Well, I'm going to push this one towards you, Elliot. Uh, I was struck by uh, your uh, comment during the interview. I think it was with Wired Magazine, in which you said, I, I would say I slept a lot better before I started working on this book. Uh, I found that very interesting. Do you still feel that way um, now that you've finished the book? Do you see positive steps being taken? This goes to both of you. You know, how do you feel now versus when you started this book? Well, I, uh, without getting into my sleep patterns, um, <laughs> and I'd say I never sleep well when I'm really working on a book because it's always rattling around in my brain. I, I think, listen, we, we have to understand that uh, that the things we enjoy are very fragile. Uh, the world system we live in now, which is relatively at peace, is an exceedingly fragile one. I mean, I think if the pandemic has shown us anything, it's shown us how fragile uh, everything we often take for granted truly is. And instead of looking to China, I'll actually you know look in the United States. I think the last few years have also shown us how fragile our democracy is. And that if we behave at home in dysfunctional ways and we allow our house to not be in order, that that poses a real liability towards uh, we're trying to deal with any external threat. So I think, you know, in the time we were writing this book, which was a time of great political upheaval at home, and we were imagining, and I was imagining along with Jim, external threats uh, one of the things that shook me the most was this question of if we were to face an external threat like this, would we be able to come out, come together again, as we've had to do so often in the past as a country, and rise up to meet that challenge? And I think the, you know, I think we all have some soul searching to do right now because on the other end of this pandemic, you know, this pandemic has not been an event that's brought the country together 
as like a 9-11 did, for instance. And I think we've just lived through one of the most uh, obviously catastrophic public health events this country has ever gone through, you know, but also a very, very difficult year in terms of our internal politics. And so I hope a book like 2034 uh, will make, will allow people to engage with a story that shows them how fraught this all is and allow them to say, you know what, what we have right now, it might not be perfect, uh, but it's, it's worth fighting for. And uh, let's get our acts together here. Okay. Can, I, um, can I inject some uh, optimism? Um, and, you know, because the, the flip of the question is, you know, you're so worried about cybersecurity and the rise of China and another pandemic. And I am, I'm worried about all that stuff. But I'll tell you three things that to me are very important about the 21st century. And I want, and they're all good things, I think. Um, so imagine you're a historian 300 years from now and you sit down, Kyle Longley, to write the broad sweeping strategic history of the 21st century. What are the three big positive things? Well, one of them, I think, it's gonna be bio, biology, biotechnology. And that will have gotten an immense jump start by 2020. We're just beginning to understand what we've learned in the process of the, uh, shall we say, rapid deployment of these vaccines. And it's, it's coming as a nexus with sequencing the human genome. All that is coming together and by mid-century, the big things going on are not going to be in cyber. They're going to be in biology, in my view. And overall, I think those are going to be positive. They'll be sequencing the genome of humans for human performance enhancement, for human life extension. There'll be changes to our foodstuffs, our crop streams, our ability to raise different strains. Um, imagine wheat that can be grown with a minimum amount of water. Um, this is going to happen, and, and we've got to deal with the ethical challenges that are inherent with it. But number one in this century, it'll be about the rise of biology. Number two, and it figures deeply in 2034, I think the rise of India will be very important because India is a democracy. India is a massive nation with young demographics. India hasn't like the United States, a very enviable geographic position, vast coastlines on an un, uh, unexploited Indian Ocean, the uh, second largest ocean on, on the planet. India's potential is enormous. And because they're a democracy, because they tend to be aligned somewhat more with the West, um, there's a lot to be cautiously optimistic about with the rise of India. And thirdly, and it's a theme that you hear in 2034, uh, this century, I think beyond those two trends, the biggest trend will be the 21st century will be about the rise of women. Martin Luther King said, the moral arc of the universe is long, it bends toward justice. I, I think that's right, but I'll tell you for sure, it bends toward women. We see women coming into more and important key positions globally. We see more and more societies where women are fully engaged. Um, think of all that human capital that's still parked on the sidelines in so many ways, blocked out of boardrooms, blocked out of governance in so many different countries. It's changing. And I feel the pace of that accelerating. That's a good thing. And uh, again, I'm talking about by the end of this century, I think those are three trends about which I'm quite optimistic. And I'll put that alongside the challenges that we've talked about. Uh, so let's, let's keep it in balance. Okay, that's a very good point. Uh, we don't wanna be depressed by the end of the hour. <laughs> and there's a lot of positives here. As you noted, you know, that there, this is a warning and we can take a, a different path if we choose to do so, both sides. Exactly. I wanted to talk to you because I do think there's a strong element of this, and I appreciate, I know the Admiral was an English major, and Elliot, I'm sure this was something also that you'd brought up, but that last quote by Faulkner that you include in the book, because no battle is ever won, they are not even fought. The fields only reveal 
to the man his folly and despair. And victory is an illusion of philosophers and fools. How do you tie that into the book? Because I found that it's a remarkable sort of bringing many of your thoughts, I thought, together. I think that, you know, one of the things that I find infinitely fascinating about war, where people will sometimes say to me, you know, Elliot, you're a war writer. Um, I've never felt like I'm writing about war. I feel like I use war to write about other things. And, you know, ultimately, yes, there's the politics of war and we could have written a historical novel about a war or a contemporary war novel or what we wrote, which is a work of speculative fiction that engages with war. But the key to all of these works is always, it's always people. It's always how individuals act uh, when, the, when, the, when the chessboard is set a certain way. Uh, and that is something I find infinitely fascinating. But I think it's also important to realize that there's no end to this. You know, sometimes people will say, you, you know, the idea of being anti-war is something that to me has always seemed a little bit foolish because it's sort of like being anti-hurricane, right? One is a force of elemental nature and the other is a force of human nature. And this is coded within us, I believe, for better or worse. And so, the, you know, the first stories we told were, were war stories. War stories predate, predate the Bible. I mean, go back to, go back to Homer's writings. So, um, so I think specific to the Faulkner quote at the end of the book, it was just a slight moment to note and to note uh, for the reader at the end, you know, ultimately this story isn't even a story about China or the future. You know, this is, this is one of many stories about human beings and this one particularly particular and particularly devastating behavior we engage in, which is war. Yeah, let me, let me add to that um, because I, I wouldn't want people to go away thinking, at least in my case, that I am uh, Pollyanna-ish and that I think that there has never been a war fought for appropriate reasons. I think there are plenty of wars that have been fought for appropriate reasons, particularly crushing Nazi Germany, for example. Um, but the essence of 2034 is to point out, as Elliot just said, that so much of this is coded in our DNA. We can overcome that. We can figure out how not to go to war. But we still are going to have to confront some big issues between the U.S. and China. Um, are we going to let China uh, continue with their uh, campaign against the Uyghurs, the Muslim uh, group within China? They're building what look a lot like concentration camps. Um, do we have to confront them about that? Do we have to confront them about their preposterous claim to owning the entire South China Sea? We can't simply acquiesce in that. Um, so the question is, how do we confront without stumbling into a nuclear war? There are ways to do that, but we need to be careful and understand that controlling that ladder of escalation once you start confronting in a righteous way, some of these uh, patterns of behavior, you still have to control that ladder of escalation. Boy, that is hard to do. They don't manage to do that well in 2034. Someone else has to step in and end the war. You'll have to read the book to find out who. But uh, my point is there, in this case, um, between these two nations, we still have time to negotiate these issues, I think, and avoid the events of 2034. Very well said. Um, and it, I think that would be something that would be of interest to the readers or, or to the people listening right now. And I saw one of the questions related. What would be some policy prescriptions that you might uh, present uh, if you were to advise the current administration on how to deal with these major issues? Well, I would start by saying have a plan, have a strategic plan. I, I give the Trump administration credit for recognizing the looming tower that we're talking about here of, of a rising China. But I don't think they ever grappled with it strategically. It was very episodic. You know, one minute President Xi is suddenly uh, appears to be President Trump's best friend forever. He's having dinner a long boozy dinner at Mar-a-Lago. And then 
three months later, we're slapping 40% tariffs on, which is a dagger pointed at the heart of the Chinese economy. Those both might be valid options for policy, but they don't work together. <laughs> You've got to have a coherent strategic plan that blends military deterrence, diplomatic initiatives, cultural understanding and engagement, strategic communications, working with allies, partners, and friends. Those are the key policy uh, ideas here. And uh, you can't grab one and try it and then throw it back in the bag and then pull another one out. You need to lay it out, decide how you want to deploy it, do it in a way that demonstrates both strength, confront where you must, but finds zones of cooperation with China to try and build confidence. Example, climate. Example, pandemic preparation. Example, disaster relief, humanitarian operations. There's plenty we can cooperate on with China. So confront where you must, cooperate where you can, have a strategy. I think that's the right approach from what I can see in you know, the first couple of months here. That's roughly uh, the way that the Biden team is going to approach China. Um, I haven't turned on the news today, but even as we're having this excellent conversation, Secretary of State Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan are in Alaska meeting with their Chinese counterparts, nine hour conversation. I think it'll probably set the groundwork for an initial summit between President Xi and President Biden. That's a good thing. And no, there will not be a absolute set uh, of policy prescriptions, but it's the start of what I think will be a, a year or two of conversation, hopefully a strategic plan that will reduce the tension, find the zones where we can cooperate, confront where we must. Uh, I think that's the right kind of strat strategic approach. Elliot, would you like to add to that? I think I think Jim covered it. Okay. Uh, well, I, I would ask you then. Uh, there's characters in the book that aren't American and Chinese. How do they fit into the overall story? I mean, we've got Russians, Iranians, Indians. How do you see that uh, as furthering the the novel and our understanding of what is coming in the future? Well, I think one of the things the book shows, and particularly as you see events play out, is you know just the obvious way all of these nations are, are deeply interconnected, you know, and also the ways that alliances can shift uh, in unexpected fashion. So, I mean, you know, we see in the opening of the book with this incident a level of collusion between China and Iran that would probably surprise many today uh, with regards to how they are coordinating their military efforts. Um, I'd say one of the great challenges in the book, uh, in terms of just the, the writing of it and the crafting of this world, was we had two objectives that at face value you would see to be, seem to be immediately at odds with one another. We wanted to create this sort of intricate or, or intimate um, character-driven book where you really get to know and get invested with just you know five principal characters. And we wanted that book to cover a war that encompass the the entire world. So how do we how do we do that? How do we get the move these characters around so you can both, you know, both feel the scope of this thing, um, but also do it in a way where you're you're invested with the people who you're who you're traveling through this world with. And so you'll see how the characters move through the book. I think in some ways it's pleasantly surprising, um, but uh, you know it, it creates scenarios where you see a national security advisor who's very active in India, for instance. You see an uh, Iranian Quds Force colonel who finds himself working with the Russians. And uh, again, though, that only highlights the way that we are all interconnected uh, and that uh, that interconnectivity in a world war would make that world war look very different than the 20th century world wars that, that we all remember. Very well said. Well, uh, this last one is partly a statement uh, and it's sort of tongue in cheek, so please take it for what it's worth. And a question, uh, and they're both directed toward the Admiral. First, I want to wish your wife, Laura, a happy birthday. <laughs> nice catch. <laughs> yeah, so I, I caught that this morning. And yeah, she's 35. Well, we asked. noticed on the cradle. <laughs> and then the finally, here's the, the, the fun question. 
how is Penelope doing and how does she see this book? <laughs> so <laughs> my wife, Laura, who is in fact age appropriate, uh, we've been married for uh, 40 years uh, this year in May. Um, we have two lovely daughters, uh, Christina and Julia, but we just welcomed a new member to our family and that would be Penelope. Penelope is a Basset Hound. She's our uh, fourth Basset Hound over the years. And uh, she is a very sweet girl and is doing very, very well. Thank you, uh, whoever asked that question. Sweet on all accounts. Yeah, well, I, like I said, we were talking a very heavy subject. I just thought we'd lighten it up a little bit more <laughs> uh, before we went into the questions. So I will now turn it over to Rick, uh, who will be following up with questions that have been coming in in our chat. And let me just say thank you to both of you. Wonderful work. Uh, I look forward to the movie uh, and you know going forward from this. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Kyle. Look forward to uh, your next book as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Fascinating discussion. Uh, and thank you both, um, Admiral and, and Elliot. Um, I'm just going to run through uh, the direct questions that we've gotten from our audience. And there's been um, a tremendous number of them. So I'm sorting through them here. And we'll kind of go fast and furious, if you don't mind, to get as many in as, as we can. Um, the first question is something that was mentioned early on uh, by the Admiral, uh, perhaps a question for you. but. Where does uh, the, the United States Space Force sit and how does that perhaps relate into uh, the war of the future, perhaps 10 years out? Uh, creating a Space Force was smart. I, was, uh, I applauded the Trump administration's choice in doing so. Uh, it has made the turn with the Biden administration. Um, I think the next big uh, movement along those lines would be the creation of a cyber force. It'll be like the Space Force in that it'll be small, elite, say 10 to 15,000 people uh, in each of them compared to you know a million all in in the uh, land forces of the United States. So tiny numbers of people, highly elite, uh, but we need uh, not only that cyber force, but also a space force. Uh, watch that space. There'll be one within the next year or two, I would guess. Thank you. Here, here's a specific, uh, sp I suppose, tactical question. Um, how many ships would uh, China need to invade Taiwan? Uh, they, I think I'll put it this way. They have all the ships they need to invade Taiwan. And uh, it, it, remember, this is their home court. And so uh, they will, by the way, they'll be flying people in. The first thing that'll happen is the airports will be taken down. There'll be uh, assassination teams operating inside Taiwan who have been there probably for two decades. I think the Chinese have been thinking about this for a while. The airfields will be critical and you're just gonna see wave after wave of military arriving. Uh, the ships will be there primarily to hold off uh, US intervention. Uh, but unfortunately at this moment, uh, China has sufficient warships. They've got 450 warships. The U.S. has around 300. Uh, ours are better, bigger, have higher endurance. But because of that home court advantage, um, it'll be a very tough fight. I, I hope we can avoid it. Thank you. We've, we've heard a lot about how AI and cyber can contribute to future wars and conflict, but do we have any, do you, do you guys have any thoughts as to how those two um, trends can actually promote you know, peaceful relations and, and contribute to, to a better future? Um, I think they can certainly, you know, contribute to a, a peaceful future. Again, I don't want anyone to think that we're down in the dumps and, and, and <laughs> believe this is a predictive work of fiction. I think all of the technologies that we've seen over the past several decades have led to interconnectivity and higher understanding between peoples of different nations. I will say one thing with uh, tech and AI and cyber in this book is one of the ways we laid it out in the book was to also show how it can be a great inhibitor and in that when you believe as you know the United States often does that you know, our military is the most technologically advanced that we possess all of these advantages over an adversary uh, when there's that cyber attack and those advantages are taken away and the F-35 doesn't respond to its controls 
um, suddenly you need to start fighting a different type of war. And militaries that can adapt to that are going to have an inherent advantage in whatever the next conflict is. And in the book, it is not an accident that the first aircraft you see is this sleek F-35 strike fighter. And the last aircraft you see on the battlefield is a first generation F-18 circa late 1980s. I'm going to add a quick thought, which is that as these offensive cyber weapons become the equivalent of a nuclear weapon in terms of their impact on a society, being able to take down the entire electric grid, for example, as they get more dangerous, there will be increasing pressure in the international system to come to the negotiating table to create a strategic cyber treaty. Uh, much like we have a strategic arms control regime, much as we have a, de a deterrent regime of mutual assured destruction, we're approaching that in cyber. So in a kind of a silver lining way, as these offensive tools get more devastating, there'll be a higher desire by both sides, I hope and I think, to come to the table and create um, mechanisms for deterrence and control. Let's hope so. so absolutely. Um, the question that I think many of us wonder about, because we don't often hear about this in the paper, um, quote, we never hear about the USA attacking China and Russia through cyber, only the other way around. Is the US actually engaged in, in attacking them? Is there, is there efficacy there? What's going on? Um, I, I am constrained by classification and clearances that I hold. I will just say uh, we, we can hold our own and we do hold our own. Good answer. Um, in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, what will that look like uh, in, in 10 years, in 2034? It wasn't really touched on in the book, but certainly we saw a you know, very, very strong and, and hegemonic China in the book. Um, well, uh, Elliot may have a comment there as well, but um, Iran, by the time of this novel, 2034, is, is very aligned with China. That's a direct result of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this is China's plan is to uh, co-opt economically as many nations as they possibly can along the route of the Belt and Road, because I always say one belt, one road, it's got one problem. Its problem is India. India is parked literally right in the middle of the Silk Road to the north and the maritime route to the south. So as a result, the Chinese very much want a strong relationship with Pakistan, which they have historically, and Iran is the new prize for them. And by the way, if you've been following this, about seven or eight months ago, with great fanfare, they signed a $200 billion agreement uh, between the two nations, basically cash going into Iran from China. And then secondly, the alignment of China and Russia, uh, which is not perfect, but I think that's how it'll be, um, is in fact happening right in front of our eyes. A week ago, Russia and China signed together an agreement to put a space station on the moon. Um, they are working more and more closely together. So I think the world of 2034, the novel, pretty accurately reflects a successful One Belt, One Road initiative that's occurring in front of our eyes. Wow, interesting. I would only add in the, you know, in, in the book, <laughs> we, we see that the uh, economic downturn around the pandemic, as well as sanctions in Iran, make it more amenable to align closely with China and the, the world we've imagined. That's how they arrive at that point. And it was fun to write a book uh, in which Russia you know, wasn't fulfilling its sort of classic Cold War uh, role, its bipolar antagonist, but was more fulfilling a role as a spoiler. And, you, and you'll see sort of all the mischief they get up to uh, in this conflict between the US and China. Interesting. One question relates to um, China's one child policy and um, how that might you know, expedite change or otherwise you know, inhibit uh, you know, China's uh, rise as it, as it moves forward in the next decade. And I guess I would just add to that, we had a speaker earlier um, in the year who commented on 
the very much changing demographics in, in China and how that's a disadvantage, as well as um, the rise of robotics. Can you comment on uh, China's demographics with, with, uh, with reference to the one child policy? Yeah, it's been a disaster for China, full stop. Um, it has crushed their population growth. And maybe worse than that, people have now just become normalized on having a one child household. And they kind of see it as that's the norm. Why would we want another one? And it has also led tragically to the aborting of uh, millions and millions of female embryos because there's a proclivity for male children. So uh, this has led to a situation in which there is a significant gender imbalance, which induces in a society a competition for a smaller pool of females by the males, not a good situation. Those who don't end up with females, uh, who want females feel aggrieved and disenfranchised. Um, all of that is highly negative. And uh, with the declining demographic, the older population, which will have to be supported, um, is growing without youthful uh, energy and work stream to support it. It is a real Achilles heel. However, you mentioned the right word, which is robotics. And we're gonna see a part of how this plays out by watching Japan, which is ahead of China in this path, um, an even older society, but one that is keenly attuned to the use of robotics, automation, uh, many things can be done in that regard. So watch Japan. They'll be the canary in the coal mine for how it starts to turn out for China. Whether robotics can overcome that Achilles heel or not, we don't know. But uh, it would be extraordinary for China to somehow suddenly turn the corner demographically. That'll be very difficult for them. It's, it's uh, again, an Achilles heel and a real one. Right. Uh, many other questions, um, and I've got two more uh, before we come to the top of the hour, but uh, several of those uh, surround um, a comment you made earlier about the, the PLA Navy um, and how large it is, how many ships there are. Um, the question revolves around what will be, what will be that naval uh, arms race competition? What will it look like over the next 10 years, and, and will that happen? Um, it is happening now. It'll look uh, less about building big deck carriers, although I hasten to say China is building big deck carriers and nuclear powered ones. Um, they're, they've got five either in operation or on the ways. Um, we've got 11. Uh, China will catch up and they'll continue. But I think the real push will be for deep submergence, unmanned vehicles, which will probably be controlled by submarines. And uh, that is gonna be an undersea battle. Um, here, we still have a significant advantage in, in acoustic capability, quieting numbers of nuclear powered attack boats. I think uh, China will strive to catch up uh, with the carrier force and with the nuclear attack submarines. Um, they already have uh, more cruisers, destroyers, frigates, the greyhounds of the fleet that I drove around. I think those are going to be uh, less crucial than uh, the other, uh, than the submarines. I could go on for like an hour and a half on this. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm holding myself back, but that's a quick right. summary. I think we are at the end of time. I see Nora and uh, Rich Downey popping up. Yes, absolutely. And just one, one last question, which I'm sure you've um, made, perhaps, Elliot, you've thought about as well. Uh, lots of colorful characters in the book. Hopefully it becomes a movie at some point. Who are the actors that play these characters? <laughs> um, well, my, st my standing answer is, and Jim might not like this, but that the two of us sort of take on the project, how Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall took on Coming to America, and we just get in makeup and the two of us play. <laughs> play them all, like Peter Sellers and Dr. Strangelove. Exactly. I'll, play, I'll play half the characters and Elliot will play okay. the other half. That would be possibly the worst movie ever made. Fair <laughs> enough. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Nora. 
Thank you very, very much, Admiral and Mr. Ackerman. That was uh, quite informative and really appreciate you taking the time and sharing um, with us. Um, it's interesting, as you were talking about the characters and where they come from, I was born in Iran. Uh, my great grandmother from the father's side is from India. And my great grandfather from the mother's side is Russian. So three of the characters in your <laughs> book are uh, my long-term heritage. I don't know of any Chinese uh, relatives yet, but you know, maybe yeah, we can but, find something. <laughs> but most important, most importantly, and I'm serious, you're now an American, and that absolutely. is that is absolutely the whole, that's Absol the whole point. So, Absolutely. That's one welcome. of the reasons. Thank you, sir. <laughs> That's one of my uh, reason and my passion for the World Affairs Council, okay. because I truly see myself as a child of the world and not a particular country. So the day I became a citizen, I cried, by the way. When, when the judge announced me, you know, 30, 40 years ago, I cried. So that was, that was exciting. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for acknowledging the future role of the women in societies. Uh, I am not a hardcore feminist at all. I just believe in human rights. And um, I'm glad that, that the women are becoming part of the decision making and part of finding solutions for our common problems. So thank you for that, sir. And as a computer scientist, I gotta say, um, Building algorithm with no social ethics, it's going to create us problems. Yeah. So mm -hmm. as someone who used to manage software engineers, software engineers and system developers build what the requirements comes to them from the customer, whoever that customer is, whether the private sector or public sector. It is up to ethical leadership to provide and manage the algorithms and how we are utilizing it in the world, whether in business or, or you know, technology or whatever. So I'm hoping that the ethical um, behavior becomes part of our growth for computer technology and building of future AI and algorithm. With that said, I wish to thank our more than uh, 130 some people we had one by one, they are dropping off after one o'clock, but we thank all of them for joining us. We had. Um, attendees from actually all over US and some from outside of US. So that is a testament to how popular your book I'm sure is gonna be. Um, Elliot, I am very excited to meet you. I uh, hope that we get a chance to see you also in person in our future events and the same thing to you, Admiral. Yeah. Would love to extend that. We're gonna be uh, publicizing your book and it is indeed an honor to have both of you with us today. Thank you, mm -hmm. gentlemen. Wishing everybody a great afternoon. Good Thanks, day. everybody. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, bye sir. Bye bye. bye, -bye.